This morning as I read about Martha and Mary, something jumped out to me, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. And let's look at that chapter 10 of Luke, beginning in verse 38 through 42, the last verses of the 10th chapter of the book of Luke, the glorious gospel of Luke. It says, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he, Jesus, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Okay, so Jesus comes to the city, even the certain village actually, of Martha and Mary, and notice that Martha received him into her house. Let's pray for just a moment, folks. Father, we ask you to give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit would say through your word in this passage, Lord, and in the other passage that we're going to talk about and uh, uh, explore and learn of thee in. In Jesus' name, Lord, Lord may Christ be revealed through uh, the reading of your word in these moments, Lord, of uh, hearing your word. Give us ears to hear. Circumcise our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so when Jesus came into the village where Martha and Mary lived, Martha received him into her house. Martha received him, verse 38, B. Martha received him into her house. Now there was a day and time when each of us, born again believers, were visited by Jesus. He came into our village, if you will. He came a knocking on the door of our hearts, and we received him into her house, or into our house, if you will, our temple. Mary, so perhaps Martha receiving Jesus into her house, or her, as relates to us, our temple, is uh, illustrative or illustrates how we, when Christ visited, he gave us the grace and the, to repent and receive him, and we chose we chose to agree with God that we were sinners and in need of the only hope of salvation, the only one who is salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. So we repented and received Christ. We received Jesus into our house. Okay, I would imagine most people at uh, FrequentSafeGuardYourSoul.com uh, are born again, and there are some lost people, and that's why we have some things about uh, how to be saved and make peace with God on the site. But... To this audience, to the body of Christ, uh, we have received Christ into our lives. We've repented and received him at some point in our past. And uh, that's what is illustrated here, perhaps, with Mary receiving Jesus into her house. And she had a sister called Mary. Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So Martha received him into the house where both her and Mary were. And Mary sat at his feet and heard his word. Mary was settled at the feet of the Savior. Uh, okay, she had begun in the Spirit and was continuing in the Spirit. And that's what God wants out of us. Now notice verse 40, uh, 40 but Martha was cumbered about much serving. Now, cumbered means distracted or drawn different ways, all overcharged or overburdened with care or the cares of this life, as Jesus put it. Uh, now, Jesus did not rebuke her serving, but her over care in service, physical service here. There are many of us who are who have received Jesus into our house, if you will. We've been saved, but we have since become burdened with uh, the cares of this world and even the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things which draw us away from Christ and make us to be unfruitful over there in Mark 4, the parable of the uh, 
sower in the word, Jesus speaks using those very words that uh, the cares of this world, there are going to be many in hell, there are already many in hell who received Jesus into their home, but they didn't continue with him, settled at his feet, fellowshipping with him like a wise virgin believer and loving him with all their heart, soul, mind and strength as their first priority, their first love, Revelation 2, 4 and 5, but Because of the neglect of seeking his holy face, and many of you, perhaps, many or some of us, among us that are listening, we have waned. We are now committing spiritual adultery on Jesus Christ because we have something else. We have alienated the affections of our heart somewhere else onto our own lives, our own needs, so we think their needs, and our own uh, hamster wheel, if you will, in this fleeting sinful world which is uh, engaged in greed and covetousness and in uh, adultery and many other sins. We have allowed ourselves to be distracted from Christ. We have allowed ourselves because of our own uh, lack of diligence to make our calling and election sure to be drawn away to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes in the pride of life, to hearken to the advertisers and the advertisements that bombard us daily, drawing us this way and drawing us that way to this lust or to get this new thing and to to attain to this new level by getting the right car and you know, the right house and the right neighborhood and stuff. And we've we've uh, we've actually fallen away and don't even know it. Even though we have a form or a semblance of the Christian life because we read the Bible, we dabble with it, if you will. We don't really study it, some of us. And uh, we listen to messages or we go to church or whatever it is. We even have a little prayer time in the morning or whatever and during the day and at night. Uh, but we could still be backslidden in that state. The Bible says that backsliding uh, is a state that is of the heart. Proverbs fourteen fourteen. the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Notice, the backslider in heart. See, backs, uh, a backslidden state is a state of the heart. So we can have all the right things going on in our lives as far as the right uh, things, that, the motions that we're going through like like uh, Martha was uh, cumbered about much serving. She had the outward appearance of a servant, but uh, she didn't have the inner sanctum of her heart and sanctuary uh, full of the uh, the Savior. Amen? She wasn't sitting at his feet like uh, Mary, her sister, was. And we can learn a lot from Mary. I, I don't know about you, but I've had the tendency to be a Martha for my whole life. And it's only in the last several years that God has blessed me to be still and know that He is God. Amen. Psalm 46. And God wants us to be still and know that He is God. In fact, someone, uh, Sister Michelle, once pointed out to me something that I'll never forget and never will. She said, you know, the best, the best Marthas or the best outward servants that actually, you know, when you are engaged in the physical, practical, uh, charitable acts and witnessing, etc., and ministering to the body of Christ. The best Marthas are those that are first Marys. Amen? And that makes so much sense because do you, have you ever noticed when you sit at Jesus' feet, when you've had a day or a days and months and weeks and years maybe, where you really abode in the Lord, you abode, you, you were abiding in the presence of God and in the sweet communion of Jesus every day, that the, the fruitfulness of your life was so much more magnified and more powerful because when you got up to go forth in your day, having gotten up early to commune with Christ, uh, he made all the crooked places straight, something that uh, would be impossible without his favor and presence. And he empowered you, empowered your words because they were his words. You were settled in his presence. You were crucified with Christ literally and therefore the Spirit of God the life of Christ was manifesting in and through you and uh, so being a good Mary in other words learning how to worship and sit at Jesus' feet is going to cause you when you do serve and you will because you'll be uh, impelled or compelled and moved forward by the Spirit and led by the Spirit that um, 
those things that, that are done are going to be done by the power of the Holy Ghost. It will be Jesus working through you. Hallelujah. And perhaps some of us gentlemen, I speak as a man that God has saved out of His sheer mercy, undeserving of myself, that's for sure. But nevertheless, it's uh, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He has saved us. He saved me. And, you know, uh, He saved you, I, I, I hope and I suppose. And uh, perhaps it's more difficult for men to become intimate uh, or to seek out a, an intimate communion with Christ. But we've got to, we've got to do that too. And uh, it's essential for every disciple there were ten virgins likened unto the kingdom of heaven, and, or the kingdom of heaven was likened unto ten virgins, Jesus taught in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. But only five made it. The other five ran out of gas. They were like Martha here in this time of her life where she was busy about uh, the things of this world, the cares of this world, and um, therefore was distracted from pure devotion to Christ. And... Uh, that's representative of the five foolish virgins who ran out of oil. You cannot have the oil of God's presence and strength and grace, overcoming grace and power in you, uh, if you're not communing with Him. You cannot have a life with Christ without obeying Christ, to be set apart unto Him, where He truly is your first love. In fact, Jesus gave us the model of prayer when he said in Matthew 6, 6, we have it on record. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. Amen. The private communion with Jesus in the prayer closet. That doesn't mean you need to physically go into the closet where you hang your clothes although that's probably a good place, but you find a place that where you can shut your door. In other words, seal yourself off from the world. No one can hear you. No one can see you. You are alone with the Lord Jesus and the Father and communing, communing with them in holy prayer communion based on what the Bible teaches us about communion with God in prayer. Prayer is not just supplications, although that is absolutely a part, a component of prayer in the biblical economy. You know, we're to offer supplications, the scripture says, for everything. In Philippians 4, supplication is a humble request. Uh, that should be an absolute regular part of our prayer time for those in leadership, both spiritually and civilly. Uh, 1 Timothy 2. Also for those around you, especially in the body of Christ, you know, naming their name before the Lord. This is all totally biblical. But there has to be, there should be a communion with God, a communing with God in the Spirit, amen, and in uh, fellowship and with Him, hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit and the Word of God will teach us such. So here's Martha. She's distracted from sitting at her guest's feet. Jesus comes to her house physically. As he's come to our house, if you will, our temple. And yet many of us have not yet settled at his feet to hear his word. Like Marion, to worship him, to sit before him, to, to be in his word and not always rushed. And to be in prayer and have prayer time and not always be rushed. And uh, to be able to... Uh, commune with him in a special way you know that's how relationships are with people in the world and human existence here is if we're always on the run you know you ever knew, knew anybody that was always on the run you can never sit them down and have a you know look them eye to eye and have a good conversation with them and it, it just disturbed you uh maybe we are the person that people can't ever <laughs> you know sit down with and look eye to eye with and, and have a you know uh, a heart to heart communion communion with which the bible talks about in the book of proverbs proverbs twenty seven nineteen says as in water or in the reflection of looking at, you know that you see when you look into water like a mirror as in water face answereth to face so the heart of man to man as in water face answereth to faith so the heart of man to man so when two people commune together face answer it to face now it's interesting that just a few verses earlier 
In verse 9 of Proverbs 27, the scripture says, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. You know, have you ever gotten up from a sweet communion with a friend over a cup of coffee or tea and uh, or a meal and just had time to commune? You know, I see a lot of Christians doing this out and about, and I'm sure much is done, you know, in people's homes and fellowshipping, you know. Uh, the early church got together often. Jesus often ate with his disciples, you know, even after he had risen from the dead. He cooked them fish. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, there the, the were fish on the fire there when they came to Jesus there in the latter chapters of uh, the book of John. And they ate together in communion, you know. The early church uh, gathered house to house daily, you know. They did four things. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in fellowship, in uh, uh, also in, uh, you know, eating and prayer, you know. And so this is a very good thing. Jesus gathered with his twelve often and ate. He prepared food for them. Hallelujah. So they could have, why? So they could have sweet communion. I believe that's why God created tea and coffee. <laughs> that's just me, but, you know, it seems to fit with scripture and food. And uh, the need to eat it three times a day. It's not so we can just keep eating on the run, uh, but so we can sit down and get to know each other. And that's what God wants for us, to settle down and to sit down and to uh, know Him. Amen. And here we see in Proverbs 27, 9, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty count counsel. You know how, how you clean up, you, you, know, you fix your hair. Uh, and you put on some clothes that you like, that you feel like they look, you look good in them, and then you put a little ointment, like oil on your face, uh, and maybe a little uh, perfume, and uh, or for guys, you know, cologne. Uh, same thing, ointment and perfume. Rejoice the heart, the scripture says here in Proverbs 27, 9. So the, and, and you know, you feel really good. You know, you're going out to dinner with your friends or your your wife or husband or your family and you feel good i mean you've cleaned up you maybe you worked hard that day and now it's you know time to go out and get a good meal together or to uh to, to eat at home together but you you've cleaned up and you put a little oil on your face you know to keep it moist and so it doesn't age as fast amen <laughs> and you smell fresh okay uh so you feel good right anybody know what i'm talking about that's what he's i believe illustrating here uh, and then it says, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. You know, in a different way, and yet definitely in the positive way, once you've sat down and communed with someone, my, in fact, not long ago, a week or two ago, my friend Scott had me over, and uh, we talked about some things and got some things out in the open, and, and uh, man, we had some hearty counsel. Well, I walked away from there very refreshed. Amen. My heart was rejoicing. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. I had received some hearty wisdom and counsel from my friend Scott. And, and uh, long-time friend and brother in Christ. And uh, I was refreshed greatly. And you know, don't you think Mary was one who lived in a state of refreshment from above? Uh, because she continued to return to Jesus. And uh, that's what the Bible says. When we repent or return, repent or come back to the top, the pent is the top, pent house, you know. When there's a pent house, it's always the top floor. That means it's at the top. And so Christ is at the top. So we return to him, return and repent, uh, pretty much synonymous. We see that word return uh, throughout the Old Testament. And uh, that's the counterpart for repent in the New Testament. And uh, return unto me, you know, Hosea 14, 1 through 3. Bring words, to you, uh, come back to me. In other words, come unto me. We see that throughout the New Testament. Come and take of the water of life freely, Jesus says. Jesus says, come and dine. Amen. God's calling us to come and dine, to be settled in his presence, to look up to him and just tell him perhaps today, as maybe it's been a while since we told him, just say, Jesus, I want you to know that I love you. 
I love you, Jesus. To return to the Lord. Amen. To sit at his feet. To be settled in his presence. Some of us in life right now find ourselves with so many things like a whirlwind attacking and coming at us from every angle. But Jesus is saying, come unto me. What we see here, I believe, if we read between the lines, is that's Martha. Martha is cumbered about with much serving. She's got perhaps bills to pay. Anybody know about that? <laughs> uh, she's got uh, children to run here and there to soccer practice or to school or to pick up. Or uh, she's got a husband to tend to. Uh, you know, uh, guys. You know, we have gas to go put in the car, or the cars, and uh, we got uh, you know bills coming up. We've we've got a myriad of responsibilities with work and. You know, us guys that are in ministry and, and work, we got both. You know, we've got to answer this email. We've got to put in an order for that person. We've got to ask others and, and pray ourselves that God will bring in the money because, you know, we need tracks printed or we, you know, God, you know, we, we need the anointing to finish writing a post or an article to feed the flock. And, uh, we've got a message to preach that we're scheduled to preach on a radio program or, uh, uh from a pulpit or, uh, or to finishing a book we believe God's called us to write to feed the flock. You know, all of these things in life, whether you're a man, a woman, you're in ministry or you're not, you know, we have these things drawing us away. But folks, our lives need to center around our time with the Lord Jesus, like they did with Mary. Mary could have obviously was tempted to, like all of us, to have all kinds of other things to do. I mean, perhaps Mary had clothes that needed to be ironed there at the house. Maybe Mary could have been helping Martha with the food. Um, Mary could have been writing a grocery list. Mary could have been doing a myriad of things around the house, but she chose that better part, and that was to sit at Jesus' feet and to hear His Word. Beloved, I want to encourage you, as I believe the Holy Spirit would be on the wings of this message out of the Word of God, to stop. Just slow up, beloved, and stop and slow your life up and throw your hands up in your heart and just tell the Lord out of your mouth and from your heart that you love Him in your own words and that you're returning to Him and that you want more of Him and that you want Him to increase in your life and you want to be still and know that He is God and to be settled in His presence whereby everything else in your life, all the seas and the winds that rage will be settled when Jesus says, Peace, be still to all of those enemies and all of those distractions and the whirlwind of uh, afflictions and persecutions and uh, things that are coming against you and that are out of control seemingly in your life. Amen. God bless you, friend. I pray that God will give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying in this last hour. As things escalate around us, they just keep, technology is exploding as Daniel prophesied it would in Daniel 12, about verse 2 or 3. And uh, around us, and even more now than any time in history, you and I need to cut off the hand, pluck out the eye of the distractions. We need to turn off the stupid TV. We need to turn off the radio. We need to tell the children and, and the house to, or whatever is distracting you. We need to tell it, shut it off. We need to get quiet before the Lord and be settled in His presence. I don't think we're going to be those who have ears to hear what the Spirit says of the churches and being able to endure by the the the, the uh, divine energy, if you will. Energeo is a Greek word. Uh, the divine grace of God, the operational power of God. In this last hour especially, in this sinful and adulterous generation, as Jesus called it, without being settled at His feet. Scripture exhorts us to come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy afresh and find uh, grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4. God bless you, my friend. Selah.